let me know when. Admitting our guests. Grab our attendance. Okay. All of our guests are in. Fran, you're good to go. All right, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the January 12th, 2023 Connecticut Paid Lead Board of Directors meeting. I'm going to call the meeting to order now. It looks like it is 9.03 a.m. Amber, would you kindly take attendance? Yes, thank you, Fran. Okay. Good morning, welcome back everyone. Okay, so I believe Ava is not joining us this morning. Is that correct, Fran? Ava, yes, exactly. Ava and Isha, I believe. Isha, yes. Uh, Isha Canada is not joining. Um, Adrian Cochran, has Adrian joined us yet? I don't believe no, she has. Don't see her. All right, thank you. Um, Britt Marie Cole Johnson. Britt Marie, have you joined us yet? I don't believe Britt Marie has joined us yet at the moment, but we'll keep an eye out for her. Um, Michelle Gilman. Present. Good morning. Sheila Hummel. Good morning. I haven't seen her. I have not seen Sheila yet this morning. Okay. Um, Sal Luciano. I don't believe Sal has joined us yet this morning. Um, I don't think we've seen Alex yet this morning yet either. We'll keep an eye out. Ellen McKitterick. Present. Fran Pastori. Present. John Scott. Here. Mike Soltis. Here. Molly Weston Williamson. Molly, I think I saw you there. Good morning, Molly. I see you there. Can you just say present? He's oh, you're I see yeah. you say you're saying you're trying. We see you. Thank you. Okay. Holly Williams. Here. And Justin Zartman. Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the members of the public for joining us this morning. And I'm not sure that I, I don't see any legislators. Um, so thank you. I'd like to first make a motion to approve the December 9th, 2022 minutes, minutes which were distributed Monday. Uh, any further? OK. Great. May I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. The motion carries. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve the December 13th, 2022 special meeting min minutes, which were also uh, distributed on Monday. Any corrections or further discussions? I'll move to approve. Thanks, John. Second. Um, Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Any abstentions? And the motion carries. Thank you. Okay, Dave, you're up. David Markham, uh, LLP, will now present the auditor's report on the 2022 financial statements. Dave. Uh, thank you. Actually, I'm going to hand the floor right to Davey and Kogel of Markham, and he will uh, present the annual financial statements of the authority for fiscal year ended June 30, 2022. Damien, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, Thank you, Fran. I'm going to uh, share my screen if that is Double uh, You're if I'm able to. Um, is everyone seeing my screen at the moment? We can yes, see your yeah. screen. Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm going to present the audited financials for the authority as of June 30, 2022. Um, on this page, I just had a few areas of discussion that I wanted to highlight as I go through the presentation. Feel free to ask questions as I move through the presentation. I hope uh, it will be a, a pretty short presentation. Uh, just a quick background highlights. Um, contributions began for the authority in on January 1, 2021. Um, effective January 1, 2022, uh, claims uh, for benefits uh, were started to be submitted and paid um, for the authority. So that was new for fiscal 2022 year. Uh, Markham's financials or the financials 
reflect um, the six month end or the 18 month ended June 30, 2021, and the 12 month ended June 30, 2022. Um, and Markham issued these financials on November 10th of 2022, and they were presented to the Finance and Audit Committee on November 18th, 2022. On the, the, the first thing we wanted to just highlight is uh, our audit opinion did change from last year uh, to the current fiscal 2022 in terms of presentation. We did still render an, uh, an unmodified audit opinion on the financials, which is the highest level um, that for, for uh, any opinion that we, we issue. Uh, we did our audit in accordance with government auditing standards um, and just to, to highlight that the, the authorities' financials included um, a management's discussion and, and analysis and supplemental pension and OPEB schedules, which were subjected to limited procedures. Um, and as such, we do not express, uh, our audit opinion does not um, express an opinion on those schedules themselves. The area where we spent most of our time this year was the benefit claims expense and claims reserve, uh, primarily because this was new to the authority for the current year. Um, as a result on the financial statements, you'll see benefit claims expense of $144 million for the six-month period that they were effective. Uh, actual cash paid out for those were approximately $104 million. Um, and then the authority recorded a reserve of about 40 million, uh, which was um, actually determined by Spring Consulting Group. And in that actual determination, they broke the, the reserve into three categories, uh, reserves that for uh, open claims that were approved and outstanding for payments as of June 30, 2022, um, reserves for pending claims that claims that were received but had not yet been approved or denied as of June 30, 2022. And then claims that were that had not yet been reported as of June 2022, but related to that period where a leave had started prior to June 30, 2022. Uh, based on that, Markham obtained um, the detailed information for the claims expense, we performed detailed testing. Uh, we reviewed the qualifications offspring. Uh, we also had uh, an actual consulting group on our side. Just take a look at the inputs and some of the assumptions that went into the reserve calculation. Um, and based on all of those procedures, we concluded that the reserves were um, reasonably stated within a range. Uh, as of June 30, 2022. Um, I also would like to add that uh, uh, at the, the Finance and Audit Committee, Spring Consultant did do a, a, a quick update on what the reserve projections would be, and they had recommended a slight decrease. Um, just that does not affect um, our financials as of June 30, 2022 because the reserves as they're developed are as of that point in time based on uh, ac information that we and Spring use to develop the, the, um, the, the reserve or the estimate. Um, and this is typical in the industry where we do our best estimate to, to, to reserve. And then as we get more information, better history, that reserve gets trued up um, accordingly um, next year. So there will be uh, a potential disclosure in, the, in next year's financials, which would um, note the fact that, you know, based on developments, the reserve has been adjusted up or down uh, based on more information. Uh, this next slide uh, just uh, highlights the Pension and, and OPEB plans, um, similar to last year, they are they, they were performed uh, by uh, Kavanaugh McDonald did the pension um, actuarial calculation at the statewide level, statewide level, and Siegel Group did the OPEB calculations at the 
the statewide level. And then once the information was uh, pulled together, the state auditors uh, recalculated based on the proportionate share of the authorities, um, employees, and, and certain other assumptions to come up with um, numbers that the, the authority would record on their books. Uh, for both uh, pension and OPEB, you'll see swings from prior year to the current year, and that's primarily driven by the fact that in the prior years, uh, in the prior year, um, the authority was fairly new and just starting to uh, bring on employees, uh, which significantly increased in fiscal 2020, 2021, um, which impacted the calculation of these liabilities. Um, one other note, uh, the, the calculations that are performed by both consulting groups were done as of June 30, 2021, and then projected forward uh, through June 30, 2022, which is another, um, which is pretty normal in the industry as well. Um, this next slide really just highlights um, the financial statements themselves. Um, just indicating that, you know, the authority grew in terms of the, the, the assets that they have on their books from about 216 million to about 506 million. Um, and it's primarily driven by the cash and investments in, uh, that come from the contributions and then get it in, in, invested in the, in the stiff account. Contributions receivable, um, I'm sorry, contributions receivable uh, were about 104 million as of June 30, 2022, compared to about 99 million in June 2021, which is fairly consistent. Uh, the contributions receivable are about a 60 day run out period um, where the authority looks at what comes in um, through August uh, 31st related to uh, June 30, 2022 year end. Uh, on the liability side, that also increased significantly, and that's primarily driven by the benefit claims reserved, which uh, I spoke about on the previous slide, uh, coupled with the pension, the increase in the pension liabilities year over year. Uh, other financials, hi financial highlights um, from the contributions perspective, it uh, almost doubled from the la from last year, um, which is within our expectation, considering that uh, last year there was uh, 20, fiscal 2021, there was uh, six months of information or contributions compared to a full 12 months of contributions in the current year. Um, as a result, there was a lot more uh, invest of in a lot more investment income, um, almost a million dollars in investment income as a result of those um, contributions being invested. Uh, deductions um, were primarily driven again by the benefit claims expense, about 144 million, uh, which was previously discussed. Um, other increases in include um, your benefits administration, which is tied to your AFLAC contract, which is reasonable. Um, all your other um, benefits and salaries increased, increases were driven by a combination of uh, increases in, in, in your employees year over year um, and your increase in your pension and OPEB liabilities. And as a result of all of that activity during the year, you're, you increase the net position, the authority increased their net position by 241 million as of June 30, 2022. Um, just other communications, uh, there were no unrecorded audit adjustments as of June 30, 2022. We worked with management um, just to work through the final entries related to the pension and OPEB. Um, numbers that were audited by the state auditors of public accounts and management took full uh, responsibility for any of those adjustments that were that we discussed. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, if anyone has uh, any questions, uh, you can feel free to ask now or my contact information is included here. 
Um, thank you for the time. And, thank you, Damien. Any questions? You are welcome. Any questions or feedback for Damien? It sounds like a great report. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank okay, you. We're gonna we're gonna move right along. Um, Michael, would you lead us in the discussion regarding the proposed private plan audit guide? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can everyone see a blue screen private plan audit guide on it? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, thank you. So I'd like to talk for brief, very briefly about um, the private plan audit guide that we have been spending basically the past 12 months trying to develop. Um, the board should have received two documents, um, both with very similar names. One says policy document. The other one has a date. I think it's January 23 on it. They're both basically the same document. The policy document is the one that we're asking the board today to post for, to vote to post for notice and comment from the public. Um, that has a little bit more instructions about how the guide works. The other document, the one with the date on it, is more of what the document will look like in an actual audit. So we shared both, but really the important one today is the policy document. I do plan on going through this presentation kind of quickly. Um, I know we have a big agenda. I don't want to steal time from other topics. I'm really looking forward to the next topic, the year interview. So I'm going to go fast, but obviously happy to answer any questions that the board has um, once I'm done the structure of the guide. So we kind of took a audit in a box approach to the guide where kind of the guide, you, you go through the guide in order. It walks you through all the necessary steps of the guide of the audit. Um, you fill in boxes, check out, check things off, um, fill in dates, that sort of thing. And then at the end of the audit, you sort of have everything in a workbook about what happened over the course of the audit. Um, the two things that won't be included in the guide are the any documents that they need to share any files they need to share we have a separate system to securely transfer those documents and then the report itself will be a separate document rather than being inserted into the guide itself um so this is for private plans part of our oversight responsibility is making sure those private plans are operating the way they're supposed to according to the minimum standards of the law the guides laid out pretty straightforward we have three sections um, and then an appendix the first section essentially just level sets what's going to happen over the course of the audit Second section is the kind of meat of the audit, the audit itself, where we kind of establish timelines, um, responsibilities of any party to the audit, um, as well as then going through um, one of the four audit topics through the checklist and making sure each item was met. Finally, at the end of that process, we would issue a report. There's a draft report followed by a final report, um, the results of that, uh, of the audit. And then we have an appendix, which is sort of just like a cheat sheet of important dates. Um, so if anyone needs to know when something is due, what deliverables are, are needed, um, they don't have to go searching through the guide for it. They can kind of find it all on one page. So we thought that would be helpful during the audit. As I mentioned, there are four kind of categories of audits we, we anticipate performing. Um, any individual audit will probably focus on only one of these, although it is possible we may have one with multiple categories. But the four areas we felt necessary to kind of review through the audit process were the application, um, basically making sure that all the appropriate steps are followed when they've submitted their application for the private plan. Contributions, making sure that employees are not um, required to remit contributions in excess of the maximum allowable contribution rate, as well as making sure those contributions are used for acceptable purposes. In other words, used for the private plan. They, all the contributions must be used towards the private plan. Third category is financial solvency, um, basically making sure that the private plans are um, adequately funded to be able to cover the cost of administering the program, most importantly, being able to pay for future paid leave requests. And then finally, there are the claims audits, which is sort of, we, we review a sample of claim files and just make sure that they were adjudicated appropriately, making sure employees were receive the benefits to which they were entitled to under the program. Once we kind of run through the audit and go through the checklist for each category, we would have a report that would be issued. We do plan on having an initial report um, of any conclusions we find, and then provide the opportunity for the subject of the audit to respond um, to that initial report, potentially have a meeting to discuss um, the things we have found, and then we would issue a final report. Um, and if we, if necessary, we can include corrective actions about what steps we wanna see in the future, um, including timelines for those steps, um, and then that follow-up for the, if there's something we need to do. As I said, I tried to go through this very, very fast. Um, very high level, happy to answer any questions. Um, two quick points I want to make 
ago. Um, I want to say a big thank you to Amber, Kathy, Aaron from the Authority. This was a group effort. Um, I did not do this alone. I just get to be the one who shared it with you all. Um, I want to thank Sun Life for um, allowing us to do a test run of the audit, make sure we were on the right page. And then I definitely want to thank the Connecticut Insurance Department. They were invaluable, particularly early on in um, creating the checklist and making sure we were on the right path um, for this. That was kind of topic one. Topic two, um, nowhere in here did I mention penalties or termination of the plans. Um, those are on the table, but that's not the goal of the audit. The audit is about compliance, making sure these plans are doing what they're supposed to. We know the program is complicated. We know that it's brand new. We know that we're slightly different than other states, so that there might be some confusion that occurs because of that. So the goal of this is making sure that the plans are providing the minimum standards um, required by law, not a funding source for the authority. So while it's possible we may need to terminate, that's not the goal of this. So as I said, I went through that incredibly fast. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board has. Um, no, no, I see Molly has a question. Yeah, I just had a, a quick one. Um, so for the solvency audit, um, it sounds like there's basically two versions. So if it's a self-insured plan, the solvency audit is looking for, are the financials of the, the plan itself sufficient and is the bond there? But for um, a plan that's through a commercial carrier, basically all you're doing is checking that they have a policy because the insurance department is already handling their solvency. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, we're kind of riding the coattails of the insurance department. They've kind of vetted the insurance company and we sort of accept that if they're an approved insurance carrier, we will we'll do that. And then self-insured, we do do a little bit more, a deeper dive into their financials. Got it. That makes total sense. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Anybody else? I don't see any hands up on my screen. Okay. Michael, that was um, quick but thorough, so thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So may I have a, much, a motion to authorize the authority staff to post the private plan audit guide for public comment? So moved. May I have a second? Second. Good. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Aye. Count? And Sorry, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Now on to exciting things. We're going to move to item number seven. Erin, I'm turning it over to you and the team to share with us the year in review. And the plan Thank you so much. I'm just going to grab the slide. Um, so this is going to be a team effort in terms of presentation. I will start and then hand it continue to be in charge of the moving the slides, but various ones of us will talk about different pieces. But we are a year into paying benefits for claims, two years in for contributions, um, and it's a time of change for the authority. So this is a good time to look at where we were, where we are now, and where we're going um, in regard to outreach and engagement, registration and contributions, private plans, and claims administration. There's going to be a lot of detail on these slides. Um, but we're all trying to hit the high levels instead of reading them. But if there's any information that you'd like us to focus on, please let us know. We, of course, will share them. I think it's a lot easier to read graphs in your own home instead of on the slide. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jess. Thank you, Erin. Um, so in terms of outreach and engagement, let's start with where we were. So in summer of 2020, that's when the outreach and engagement work began with the development of our branding and our logo. Um, so all the great things that hopefully are now uh, pretty you know, commonplace when you're driving down 84 or when you hear a radio commercial, all that work started um, in summer of 2020. We also began our community outreach and our webinars, even though um, <clears throat> we weren't accepting contributions yet, we wanted to start to let the business community know this was coming and what they should expect. September 4th, 2020 um, is when our Connecticut Paid Leave website launched, and that's also when our Contact Us feature went live, which of course is staffed by our great partners at the United Way. Next slide, please. Um, so where we are now, uh, in, we could have put 
20 slides together showing where we are now, but um, instead Aaron had the great thought to put this into a word cloud. So this really represents all the different things that we've been doing in terms of our mass media, which includes our radio, our TV, um, our billboards, print ads, Nancy's wonderful podcast that brings light to so many different topics that relate to paid leave, um, our interviews, our testimonial videos, which are the newest um, asset that we've introduced to focus on real people who have used our program and what difference that has made in their lives. Um, all of the different digital and social media outreach we do, and of course, the live events, webinars, conferences, uh, and many, many partnerships that allow us to get into the community in different ways. Next slide. Thank you. Um, in terms of some data, uh, I think that you know from my monthly presentations that I really love to look at the numbers, and so we just wanted to share some comparisons of 2021 to 2022. Um, High-level overview of our website. You can see the jumps um, from 2021 to 2022, certainly to be expected, as in 2022, much more of the general public was using our website to find out about claims, how to file claims, how the program worked. Um, but we were over 800,000 users in 2022 with over 2.2 million sessions and over 7.5 million page views. So we know that our outreach efforts have been working. They're getting people to our site. We're engaging with them. They're looking at a number of pages and they're coming back multiple times. Um, we also... Um, we also saw substantial increases in our social media. So our YouTube views, our Facebook engagement, our LinkedIn engagement all increased from 2021 to 2022. And then in terms of our speaking engagements, um, and our webinars, we did over between 2020 and 2021, over 215 engagements. So that was a lot of that initial work to let people know about the program, that it was coming, what they needed to do to prepare. Um, and in 2022, we did 91 of those um, webinars and speaking engagements and a number of in-person events in both time periods. Our email newsletters, we continue to grow that audience and we continue to provide information that is timely and relevant. We saw our open rates jump from an average of anywhere from 14 to 39 percent to 30 to 52 percent in 2022. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, in terms of the Contact Us Center, this is a quick snapshot of the Contact Us inquiries and the reasons for those inquiries. So nearly 20,000 in 2021 and uh, just about 18,000 in 2022. Um, the 2021 uh, reasons are shown in green. So that was more generally asking a question. A lot of those were internally generated, so we didn't necessarily have a topic to put to them. But then we started to uh, realize what kinds of questions people were asking most frequently. So we established our drop downs to correspond to those. So you can see in 2022, a lot of questions about benefits, a lot of questions about FMLA, um, help with registrations, help with payments. So all things that sort of make sense as we transitioned over into the claims um, administration. Next slide, please. And so uh, with that, where are we going? How are we using all of this data? So we are, as you've heard, replatforming and expanding our website with a plan to launch in spring of 2023. We're using all of this data that I've just shared with you to continue to refine our outreach, to find different areas where there may be gaps and to also um, figure out ways to bolster where we know we're being successful. And um, we are really focused this year on uh, establishing some ambassadors. So really working with service providers such as social workers, patient um, advocates in hospitals and medical care settings to help them amplify our message to those end users. And of course, as you've heard Dave and his team talking about, um, fund recovery is going live. And so we will be supporting those efforts with the robust outreach campaign as well. And with that, um, that wraps up outreach and engagement. Dave? Okay, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> we'll spend a few minutes talking about registration and contributions. So where were we? So about a couple of years ago, which uh, it seems a lot sooner than that, but time flies when you're in the middle of a pandemic. We opened up, we opened up registration for all employers, and then a 
four months later, we were collecting contributions, which were ultimately due by the end of April. Uh, in retrospect, it's really amazing everything we accomplished during that time. They say, may you live in interesting times. And I think everybody involved with the authority can definitely check off that box uh, for what we were doing back then. Let's go to the next slide, please, Aaron. Thank you. So where are we now? And let's talk about registrations first. So the graph on the left shows the cumulative effect of the registrations that uh, have come into the authority. We're currently at about 143,000. We got over 100,000 by the end of the first quarter of 2021. And thanks to our outreach efforts since then, we've had a steady increase in the number of employers that have registered. The chart on the right shows the spread of the size of employers in terms of employee size. We have uh, data for about three quarters of the employers. We don't have it for all of them, but we're looking to get that. But even with three quarters, you can see that uh, the bulk of the size of the employers, over half of them are, are employees of less than 10 people. And this is consistent with what we've seen from data with other state agencies. Let's go to the next slide, please. Contributions. Okay, so this graph, I'm gonna set the stage. This is contributions by calendar quarter. The line on the left, the, I'm sorry, the line on the bottom, the blue one, is for calendar year 2021. The line above it, the orange one, is for calendar year 2022. What does the graph tell us? Well, number one, it tells us that the contributions were higher in 2022 than the prior year. Why is that? Number one, there was more awareness uh, by employers of their obligation to pay into the fund. Number two, there were more people working. And number three, there was a higher minimum wage base and in fact, a higher wage base period. We've broken the wages out into quarters. Uh, so what does the data tell us here? So as you can see, the number goes down as the year progresses. Why is that? The biggest driver of that is the social security cap. When you pay contributions into the fund, it gets capped out at the social security amount or FICA. Uh, as time goes on, more people reach that cap. So there's less people contributing into the fund. You'll notice that uh, the amount is significantly higher in the first quarter of 2022 compared to first quarter of 2021. And then it's not so much in the second quarter. And why is that? Well, first of all, uh, in 2022, the orange line, the DOL was still allowing employers to make catch up periods. And the first quarter of 2022 was the last quarter they were allowing that. So that number was larger than it normally would have been. Conversely, the prior year, the number was smaller than it would have been because employers were still figuring out how to pay into the authority, that they had to pay into the authority. And so when they realized it, they start, they, some of them paid in the second quarter and beyond. So the first year, the blue line is not really a trend. Uh, I wouldn't use it as a trend line for the future because the first year is always, things are gonna happen, right? Any, any new program, it's to be expected. Um, but, uh, but so far so good. Uh, we've seen consistent increase uh, over last year, almost 11% to date. Let's go to the next slide, please. As a result of those contributions, the fund balance as of November was over $458 million. We engaged actuaries uh, spring. Uh, if you've been to prior board meetings, you've heard them speak. One of the things they do is they do metrics on our solvency and uh, those solvency. And so those tests have all met the targets. We are either meeting or exceeding uh, any solvency tests uh, so far from the actuaries. Let's go to the next slide. So where are we going? So at this point, we are moving our focus from registration 
to compliance. It's been over two years. And uh, to be fair to those who are paying in already, uh, we feel it's time to start imposing penalties and interest to any employers who haven't paid or who have underpaid. And that will go into an effect, and that will go into effect May 1st of this year, uh, the very beginning of uh, the second quarter of the year of when contributions are due. Um, our path to success uh, for this compliance includes a combination of refining our messaging, as well as a new approach that incorporates better technology, more accurate data, and a consistent methodology to fund recovery. Uh, we'll be measuring that success via uh, the number of new compliant employers we have, as well as the contributions they make. And we'll be reporting that to the board about every six months. Uh, what you see now on the board is a timeline of our, our path to success. And uh, it includes right now focusing on missing and late uh, payments. And then we'll move on to underpayments, also working with Jess on our outreach efforts. So employers and employees too, for that matter, understand that it's, uh, that it's coming. Uh, so um, if you pay before May 1st, there won't be any penalties or interest. We'll also be working with a third party vendor uh, from the state of Connecticut that has expertise in collecting contributions that get older. And we're also mm -hmm. making sure we're adequately staffed for this fund recovery effort. And that's where we're headed in terms of contributions going forward. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna talk briefly about private plans. Sort of my swan song as I hand over responsibility for private plans to Michael and Kathy. Um, as you may recall, we adopted a policy for provisional approvals in the fall of 2020 um, and began accepting private plan applications in February of 2021 uh, with a final policy uh, and procedures document adopted in November of 2021 before any plan went live. Um, and that final document included a policy guide and checklist and sample plan documents. So the first two years were really getting the policy of the private plans sort of up and running in consultation with the insurance department and the insurance industry. Where we are now is we have 658 approved plans. The vast majority of them are fully insured, although we have a handful of self-insured. Not surprisingly, most of the plans um, were approved to take effect January 1st, 2022. Um, so as of the date that claims would go live. So those were the um, plans that submitted their applications in 2021. And of that 450 odd, the about two thirds of them uh, were approved in the first quarter of 2021 um, so that they were able to avoid, um, because of the alternate compliance, if they're approved in the first quarter, they didn't have to make any contributions to us. But we have seen sort of steady um, path of applications continuing to come in, some with new employers, some with employers who uh, are switching insurers. So it's just sort of moving in and out. Where we're going, um, we are developing a private plan newsletter to make sure that we um, continue to maintain communication with our private plan employers. It is a alternate compliance method. So there's still information that they need to make sure they're complying. Thank you for approving us to go ahead with posting the private plan audit guide. We will post that once we get final comments back, we'll bring it back to the board, um, which most likely will be in March. And then we can go live with the audits. We have engaged an IT um, solution that will help us manage the audits and be able to control the flow of data in a confidential um, and secure and sort of efficient way. And then we're going on to approve renewals. Private plans are approved for a three-year period. So those plans that got approved in first quarter of 2021 are going to need to get renewed in the first quarter of 2024. And we need to um, make sure that we have a good systematic, hopefully automatic process 
for notifying their employ these private plan employers well in advance of their termination period so that they can comply with our rules about notifying us if they want to terminate or renew. So there's um, always ongoing work in the private plan world. And then I'm gonna turn it over to John to discuss claims. Thank you, Aaron. Good morning, everybody. So brief overview of claims administration over the course of the past year and starting off with where we were beginning December of 2021, we began accepting claims for benefits in connection with leaves occurring on or after 1-122, sort of a soft opening approach where we took those claims uh, 30 days early and uh, for, for benefit uh, leaves in connection with leaves after 1-122. One, one uh, January 1st of 22, we began issuing benefit payments in connection with those leaves. Next slide. And uh, over the course of the past year, the uh, approvals you can see here, successful outcomes with regard to total gross payments of about $250 million to about uh, 44,000 uh, unique employees uh, in the program over the course of the past year. And the other breakdown here you can see of some of the, the uh, the numbers associated with the benefit payments. Uh, next slide, please. And on the uh, claim status, we've shifted into um, providing some statistics based on the total adjudicated claims. So you can see in this slide that the approved claims um, totaling over 57,000 with an approval rate of 65% and uh, denied claims at 30,000 with a uh, rate of about 34.5%. And then when you exclude the COVID uh, claims which were adjudicated, the approved claims uh, percentage goes up to 70% and the denied claims percentage is at, a, at 30%. Next slide, please. And claims filed, I just kind of take a step back here for a moment. We did have 97,443 for the uh, year, but I would just kind of take a step back with regard to the soft opening in January of 5,200 claims. And then that COVID spike that occurred uh, in January uh, with a total of 9,700 claims, bringing us to uh, almost 15,000 claims in that first month uh, of adjudications and uh, benefit payments. Um, that did lead to a um, certainly a slowdown in processing of claims for some period of time, but that backlog was cleared up by uh, early June, and we've been in a, in a steady state with improvements moving forward. Um, certainly, uh, system and process improvements have, have led to significantly improved um, processing times and uh, better outcomes with regard to uh, more timely payments. Next slide. Uh, we've also shifted this slide a little bit from past slides that we've shown. The utilization rates here are for the 10 towns with the highest and uh, lowest number of claims filed. There are also the statistics related to the uh, percent of population filing for a claim. And you can see that the um, numbers here with regard to the uh, larger cities represent the highest total number of claims. And then you can also see that some of these other towns here in the uh, lowest number of claims filed are mostly in Western Connecticut and in uh, Fairfield County. Next slide. Thanks. And also some additional data on reconsiderations. Uh, as you know, uh, when an initial dot denial is made, uh, there is an opportunity for a claimant to uh, ask for a reconsideration. Many of those are surrounding uh, missing documentation or uh, documentation that is not correct. And in the reconsiderations, we have initial denials of 36,000 and reconsideration requests of 
10,000 on those 36,000 denials. So that's about a 28% uh, reconsideration request on the denials and uh, denials reversed uh, and denials upheld. Uh, you can see that the denials reversed on reconsideration represent about 69% of uh, those uh, initial denials and also a 20% um, rate of pending and 11% uh, upheld. And the timeframes on those as well, you can also see the timeframes here associated with the receipt of reconsiderations that has been steadily decreasing as well, although we've had some latitude for accepting those um, a little bit lengthier time frame in year one. And you can also see the reconsideration decision time frame uh, being made that somewhat correlates with the intake of those as well. Next slide. So I think this is Michael. Yes, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, John. And hello, everybody again. Um, just wanted to take a brief moment to talk about claims in the context of the Department of Labor appeals. So these are claims that were denied by AFLAC, our claims administrator, and then the person exercised their right to file an appeal with the Department of Labor. You can see the kind of raw numbers on the left. Um, just to provide a little bit of context about that third line, when an appeal is filed, the first step in the process is the authority is it provides the claim file to um, the Department of Labor. Um, so that and no additional action needed was when the appellant withdrew the file, withdrew, withdrew the appeal before we had a chance to provide the claim file. So sort of no action was needed. That just gives a little bit of context for those numbers. But I really want to focus on the pie charts on the right. Um, Spoiler alert, I think this is pretty good results for us and what it means for what how AFLAC is doing, um, at least in the context of appeals. The left pie chart, with the exception of that 7% that's carved out on the right, is sort of all the results that are where there's no adverse action, not, nothing's required on the part of AFLAC um, as far as the results of the appeal. The biggest category, that 38%, is no aggrievement slash moot. Most of this is where the claimant has filed uh, an appeal with Af uh, appeal with the Department of Labor at the same time that they have a reconsideration request pending with AFLAC. So before the Department of Labor can make a decision, AFLAC has actually already overturned the claim. Another portion of this is also where during the appeal, they when they filed the appeal, they submitted a document that was the one missing document that we needed for the original claim. So we've taken that document, given it to AFLAC and said, why don't you take this the little bit left to cross the finish line rather than making the Department of Labor start from scratch. So that category has a few things in it. It also has a few um, where someone filed multiple appeals for the same claim. They just didn't understand what they had, that they had already filed it. And so once a decision is issued, the next decision off in the Department of Labor indicates it's moot. Beyond that, the biggest next category is upheld the, the AFLAC decision. So that's pretty much overwhelmingly positive. The decision that was made by AFLAC was the correct decision based on the documentation that was received. And then you see a few other um, reasons why the, the, the decision, the appeal may have been dismissed. Kind of turning to the, the category on the right, even though this is sort of somewhat negative, it's still pretty good results. Um, only 3% are a true overturn of the denial. And even though that category, vast majority is they provided um, a document during the appeal that was not available during the original claim. The Department of Labor at times does give the opportunity for a claimant or an appellant to correct and cure the errors. And if they take advantage of that, they may overturn the original decision. The other two categories, the denial is overturned after CTPL already approved. That's basically when the, that circumstance I talked about earlier, where there's a parallel, the appeal decisions happening at the same time that the AFLAC still doing a reconsideration review, and they just happen to both come to the same outcome and we can't coordinate before the decision happens. So it ends up both of us agree that the decision needs to be overturned. So I think that's still a good result for um, our claims administrator. And then sustained in part, dismissed in part, tends to be AFLAC has approved their claim, but maybe the dates, a few days at the beginning or a few days at the end, the part of labor says should have also been approved. So it's pretty much agreement that the claim was approved, but maybe the dates need to be shifted a little bit. So um, as I said, I think this is great news for what is going on um, with AFLAC, our claims administrator. Um, and I, I look forward to this in the, continuing in the future. Um, I think that's it for me. I'm turning it, turn it over to Aaron. Great. So thank you. Where we're going is we're continuing to improve. Um, 
continuing to improve our communications with employers to make sure that they understand what to do, make sure that they're completing those employment verification forms correctly and getting those back to us. Um, we know employers want more reporting, which is a little bit tricky because they're not paying into the programs. They don't have sort of a right to see all the details of their employees' claims. So we're working through that, but that is an important goal for us. Um, the other two uh, bullets are claims in good order and pregnancy and bonding integration. These are initiatives that we've already started. Claims in good order relates to the fact that so many of our denials are because of failure to provide documentation. So we've been working um, for months now on how we can better communicate with our claimants as to what documents are needed, how to make sure that they know if they're in. And so AFLAC um, is sort of days away from going live with uh, a portal enhancement. So this is on the AFLAC claim portal that the claimants can create and see when they make a claim. And instead of just having a place kind of sort of the undifferentiated list of documents that are submitted, this is um, customized to each claim. So if you choose a bonding claim, the document list will show the documents specifically needed for a bonding claim. And it will show on the portal, on the dashboard exactly whether it's been received or not and whether it's required or not. It also makes it easier for um, claimants to upload and label them correctly because if they use this, it'll, it'll be labeled automatically. So we have fewer orphan documents. What's nice is that when you see the document, you've got it uploaded, you'll see, okay, well, my employment verification is in review, the claim manager's looking at it. They've already looked at my bonding statement and proof of birth. It's complete, green check mark, good to go. Oh, but my identity verification is, is incomplete. There's something I need to do. This is a visual reminder that will supplement the email or letter that the claims manager sends saying your document is incomplete or insufficient. We've got time to cure. We think this will help people um, just more easily visualize and therefore more easily understand what they need to do so that we can get them the benefits and not have to deny on the basis of a lack of document. So we're really excited about this. This was a, a pretty significant undertaking by AFLAC in terms of IT effort. Um, and so we're we're thrilled that it's actually gonna go live in February. The other big challenge that we've seen this year that we um, are already underway in fixing relates to pregnancy and bonding. If the pregnant parent takes leave, the first part of the leave is generally to recover from the physical trauma of the childbirth, often called the disability period. And many times that pregnant parent wants to continue to stay out and bond uh, because the disability period is terminated when the doctor releases the person to resume normal activities, which is usually six to eight weeks. But most people want to stay out the 12. Up until now, we've had to manage those as two separate claims because there's two separate sort of documentation requirements. And um, from an integrity perspective, you don't want claims managers creating their own claims. So it's added um, complication, it's added delay, and it's added sort of unnecessary difficult communications with our claimants. This is a large portion of our claims, so we thought this is a really great one to tackle. So AFLEC did a proof of concept to create uh, a single claim filing for both pregnancy and bonding if the pregnant parent tells us, yes, I want to continue out on leave through bonding period. This enables the single case manager to coordinate. It simplifies the document production. You don't have to have duplicate product. Documentation is a lot easier, and it also creates the potential for having that same case manager potentially also handle the bonding case for the pregnant parent's partner. As a result of that proof of concept, we had a higher approval rate, um, in part because I think we had simplified documentation requirements and we had faster decisions. The customers um, were overwhelmingly positive about this. The team internally with both the um, uh, case managers and customer care advocates thought this was great because it simplified the process for everyone, reduced questions, reduced frustration. And so 
we're rolling this out as the new process that will be handled with all pregnancy, um, any new pregnancy and bonding claims coming coming in after February will be handled with this new proof of concept. Um, those are just some of the things that show what we're doing as we transition from startup to steady state. Our goal this year is to make sure that we continue to get better. Um, some of the processes we put in place over the past two years were the minimal viable product, right? Um, good enough to get started. We need to make this happen. We have six people on staff and this is what's going to happen. But now we have you know, 30 people on staff. Now we have our partner vendors. We can look at our processes, see where we can improve, see what we can do. We are continually looking to improve and refine our data. We have a lot of agency partners um, that we will try to continue to work with to receive data, improve that data, and make sure that our decisions are driven by those data. Hmm. And as just mentioned, um, we really do think it's important to continue to expand our network of paid leave ambassadors. It's really important for everybody to have a general understanding that we exist and to know to come to us when they have an event. But realistically, most people will not think about us until the moment of their um, illness or baby or whatever, but people who work in this field um, are doing it every day. And so they're really a great resource that we really want to partner with um, and leverage. So mm -hmm. thank you for letting us speed through um, the work that we've done. There's so much that we could have talked about. Um, it's, it's been a, a, a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we're we excited for where we are and we're excited for continuing to improve in the future. If you have any questions about anything that we shared, please uh, feel free to ask us now. And as I said, we will, of course, share this slide if, and answer questions going into the future. Erin, that was a great job by you and the team. Thank you so much. Um, I know there's so much more you could have talked about because it's the accomplishments have just been remarkable. Mm -hmm. And anytime I talk to colleagues in other states about what we're doing in Connecticut, I've heard so many times about how we're a role model for so many. So congrats mm -hmm. to you and the staff. And really, this is your first board meeting as the new CEO. And I should have said in the beginning, welcome to your new role. And we're excited that you're on board. And appreciate your energy and enthusiasm and um, you have the full support of course of the board and I know your team is um, just thrilled to have you in this role so congratulations to you. Thank you. Okay does anybody want to make any comments or provide any feedback to the team on that report? Okay great we're moving right along and um, we have now committee reports Mike policy and personnel. Okay good morning uh, the committee met last week and received a briefing on the fund recovery plans, which Dave talked about earlier today, uh, as well as a staffing update from Aaron. Uh, and at our December meeting, our committee reviewed the private plan audit guide, which Mike talked about today and was voted on by the board today. And that's our report. All right, thank you. Any questions for Mike? Molly, Outreach and Engagement. Thanks so much. Um, the committee met last month. Um, we got an update on the authority's outreach and legislative work, as well as um, the goals for the winter. And we're looking forward to meeting again next week. Thank you. Holly, Finance and Audit. Yes, the committee met last month and um, received an update on fund recovery and the financial reports. And then Dave is going to uh, share with you all uh, those financial reports today. Wonderful. Dave? Thank you again. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to share my screen and we will go over the financial results for the month of November, preview of December, and a projection of where we think we'll be by fiscal year end. Uh, you can see my screen, hopefully. We can see your screen, Dave. Thank you for the confirmation as always, Amber. So for the month of November, for our operating budget, the authority spent uh, over $818,000. The significant expenses we did spend that money on were payroll and related expenses, 
of $506,000, monthly contact expense of $125,000, outreach of $97,000, IT support for $64,000. Uh, year to date, we are at uh, a net, net results of $5.6 million and we are ahead of budget by over $3.3 million. For our bond money, to date, we have spent $327,000. That's primarily been on fund recovery so far. And year to date, it's been over $554,000. We are uh, $2.9 million ahead, but we are expecting to spend that money as time goes on, including on website redesign and replatform, which we're working on. And we actually made our first payment to the vendor in December. Uh, in terms of the bond money, uh, compared to what's been allocated, we've spent uh, $11.7 million so far compared to the uh, allocation of $16 million that hasn't changed. And we have over $4.2 million remaining of uh, bond funds available to the authority. And, uh, and the uh, projects that that money will be used for will be fund recovery, as we've mentioned, claim integration and security, and the website redesign and replatform that I mentioned before, and of course that Jess mentioned earlier as well. In terms of contribution activity for the month of November, we uh, got in over a million dollars. Uh, that was somewhat behind budget of a uh, quarter of a million dollars, but that was made up by the investment income we got of over $1.4 million. Uh, that was uh, better than budget uh, by that amount. And that's primarily driven by the uh, increased uh, interest rates out there right now. Benefit payments were $22.7 million. That's been a pretty typical run rate so far for the authority. And so our net activity for the month was $22.1 million. Compared to what we budgeted at over 38 million dollars we are ahead of the game for the month of november uh, uh for the month of november by 16 million dollars and in fact uh year to date we are ahead of budget by 66 million dollars and again that's primarily driven uh by the benefits paid uh being less than what we had budgeted Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the contribution fund at the end of November was over $458 million. Uh, to date, the two biggest drivers of that were the contribution revenue of over $727 million. And on the outflow side, it's been uh, benefits paid of $219 million. Uh, as far as the balance sheet is concerned, not much fluctuation there. The biggest asset continues to be what we have in the short-term investment fund. That's over $445 million of the $482 million of the total assets. The seed funds were paid off uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, so the only liability on the books right now is for uh, the bonds. Quick preview for the month of December. Operating expenses were $1.1 million. That's a little higher than usual. That's because we had three pay periods in the month of December. That happens twice a year, and December was one of them. Uh, but the typical expense categories uh, were typical, so nothing out of the ordinary there. Claims paid from the contribution fund were $25.7 million. Um, Again, we had another week where December just happened to be uh, where the authority reimburses AFLAC. We reimbursed them on a weekly basis, and December just happened to be one of those months where it was five instead of four. Uh, so, but other than that, uh, there was nothing out of the usual there and nothing out of the usual in bond funds either. Uh, as I mentioned, we started paying for uh, website redesign and replatforming there. Contributions coming in for the month of December were over $480,000 and investment income was $1.6 million. 
So what does that all mean for where we think we'll be at the end of the year? So we think we'll be ahead of budget, certainly for operations by the end of the year. Our operating budget was two, over $2.9 million. We think we're gonna come in at over $5.2 million. Uh, that makes us better than budget by 2.3. Uh, that's uh, a higher positive variance than we reported last time. And that is primarily driven by uh, a more positive variance in payroll and related expenses. Uh, we uh, have later start dates for our staff than we originally anticipated the last time. Uh, so since they're starting later, that's less money out the door during this fiscal year. So that's why the variance is higher. And finally, the contribution projection for the end of the year, that didn't change all that much from the last time we talked. It's still at about uh, $55 million positive uh, for the fiscal year as compared to uh, a, a negative $54 million that we budgeted. So we expect to be uh, $109 million better than budget by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, that's where we are right now. Does anybody have any questions? Nice job, Dave. Thank you so much for being so thorough. Thank you. Okay. I think we can move on to item nine. Erin, your first CEO report. Thank you so much. So my first CEO report will basically be a staffing report. The first thing is that I am thrilled to introduce our new uh, benefits performance vendor manager, Pr uh, Priscilla Torcello. Priscilla, there you are. I see you. Welcome, um, Priscilla. She, Thank you. Hi, everyone. She comes to us with a great deal of experience from the disability insurance industry, um, including in particular for us that we loved, um, a great deal of experience managing third-party administrators. So um, that that just made us super happy when she interviewed with us. She joined us on December 27th and jumped immediately into work, learning about the program and um, is sort of working with, working directly for John and working with John now. One of the um, first projects is creating a more structured and thorough audit process for us as we continue to review and audit AFLAC's work. This is, um, position that we've been really looking to fill for quite a while. There's no specific concern or issue, it's just a really good practice. So um, it's, we're so happy to have Priscilla. Um, if you want to say anything. I'm oh, just um, really excited to be here and um, thank you everyone. Great, um, welcome. We're so, we're so happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's always worrying when you're like, we're so happy you're here. It's like, oh no, what happened? But uh, we have scared her today. In the two weeks that she's been here. On um, other news, as you all know, Jacqueline Cozen joined the authority about a year ago, um, and now she has gone. Um, <laughs> she has a wealth of experience and political knowledge and policy knowledge, and um, we couldn't keep her light under a bushel. Um, and she's been tapped to be the new Deputy Secretary of State working with the new Secretary of State, Stephanie Thomas, which is an amazing opportunity for Jacqueline, wonderful for the state. Um, so, so Jacqueline has, has moved across town to uh, 165 and she's working there. The good news for us is that the Secretary of State's office is one of our partners in terms of getting information about employers. So we get to continue to work with Jacqueline, even though in a different capacity. Um, and then just a couple of internal movements. Michael is going to be our new general counsel, which um, is fabulous. He steps right in. He knows more about the program um, and our policies than anybody. So it's, it's really a great opportunity for him and for us. And Kathy um, Mihailik is part of a longer planned transition, is continuing to work in benefits, but is also taking on some more operation roles. She's picking up private plans which is fabulous, um, both in terms of approvals and working with Michael on the audits, as well as assisting Michael with um, some of the DOL appeals. We do need to fill some gaps. We'll need to um, bring in another lawyer, we need to have somebody who can handle the government relations, still working through whether that's one person or two, 
Um, we have some positions open in finance that we're recruiting for that Dave alluded to. We have some positions open in IT as well. Um, and hopefully by next month, we'll have some new person in IT to, to uh, introduce you to. There's a, another Salesforce person coming through. So we started with one. So those of you who were here uh, two, three years ago, it was uh, January of 2020 is when Andrea was interviewed. She started in March. Um, and, you know, where we did a lot um, in those three years with a tiny staff in the first year, slightly larger in the second year, um, as Damien mentioned, slightly larger again in the third year. We will continue to grow a bit um, to make sure that we can continue to fill the roles that we need, but we're always very conscious of um, not growing too big too fast and making sure we have a very strong idea of what roles we need to fill and who can best fill those. As you can see, we try to utilize the talents of our existing staff as much as possible. So um, that's where we are, and that's the end of my update. All right, excellent, thank you. Do we have any old business to discuss? Any new business? Okay, I'm going to adjourn the meeting because we don't have a quorum. Um, so Amber told me I just have to say this meeting is adjourned and it is 1014. Great, thank you so much. All right, thank Great you, job, Tom. everyone. Thank you thank so you much. Bye, everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye, thank you.